Hey, leather f Wish I didn't have to censor that, would have been way more dramatic, but it's the first 30 seconds of the video, so. We are here to talk about yet another slasher revival movie. Recently, we've been talking a lot about Scream, and I also even just posted my predictions for Halloween Ends. A few months ago, I also posted my review and breakdown of the new Chucky TV show, and every other revival that I've covered I've enjoyed, but today we're taking a dark turn. I contemplated not even making this review because the consensus of this movie is pretty clear for the majority, but there are some fans that are so adamant about their love for this new installment, but I was like, you know what? I can't only make reviews on movies that I like sometimes, I just have to accept that I'll be ranting for most of the video. So today we're doing a semi-deep dive, a full spoiler-free thought section, and a plot breakdown of the new Texas Chainsaw Massacre. Since it's a brand new movie, there aren't any featurettes or behind-the-scenes stuff that's been released online yet. There also wasn't any kind of press tour because this was just released straight to Netflix, and I'm assuming they probably won't do that because the movie had a very low budget, and there was definitely a lack of interest in it for the longest time. But before I dive into the Fun facts that I did find. If you want to see any other TCM related content from me, I did a whole series on this weird franchise. There's a whole whopping buttload of Texas Chainsaw Massacre content on this channel, so that playlist will be linked at the end of this video, and if I remember, it'll also be linked down below. I have a bad habit of saying that I'll link things down below in the video, and then I just forget completely. Anyway, this feature started filming in August of 2020 in Bulgaria. However, the initial directors and brothers, Ryan and Andy Tohill, split from the project after the first week of filming. They were replaced by David Blue Garcia, who then scrapped all the previous footage and started from scratch. This is also the first TCM movie to bring back our initial final girl, Sally, from the movie in 1974. However, she's not played by Marilyn Burns because, as you probably know, she passed away in 2014. The writers and producers of this movie have had also previously collaborated on the 2013 reboot slash remake of The Evil Dead. They are also responsible for both of the Don't Breathe movies. And for my last fun fact, Legendary Pictures finally sold this movie to Netflix after a long string of disastrous test screenings. I actually called that, I think, during my most anticipated movies of 2022 video. I think we were actually supposed to get this movie this year, but then they had a lot of trouble selling it off to a streaming service, or they didn't know if they were gonna distribute it to theaters, or I don't know. After seeing the movie, it's pretty unsurprising to me why nobody would take a chance on this movie besides Netflix. Netflix was like, oof, we gotta keep the lights on somehow, and for some reason, raising our prices hasn't worked, even though we haven't even been producing any higher quality content. So far, South Korea is really brunting the load of making sure that Netflix executives are keeping their pockets lined. So executives were like, uh, sir, Legendary Pictures is still waiting on your decision about the TCM purchase. Oh yeah, horror fanatics are die hard for this shit, and it's pretty much just copying Halloween, that one with the Jason guy or whatever, so I say let's buy it. All right, I'll let them know. Uh, what, what about the release date, though? Oh, just throw it up in mid-February, I don't give a fuck. Okay. Allegedly, okay? I have no idea who actually chooses the movies that go up on Netflix. I just like making fun of rich people. You can tell that there just wasn't much care for this movie at all because there was hardly any marketing for it, and granted, maybe it was just because of the low budget. So all of that led me to believe that I should not have high expectations, which generally I never do when I go into these big franchise movies. However, after seeing it, it, it's a bad movie. Yeah, um, all my suspicions were pretty much confirmed. I'm gonna get into all my spoiler-free thoughts now, so if you haven't seen it yet, don't worry. I'll definitely let you know before the plot breakdown starts. So let's start with all the positives before I begin ranting. There are a lot of really good surprises in this movie, including the gore and the kills, which I'm sure you've seen, like, everybody say online already. I was actually very shocked by the brutality of Leatherface. He had some of the best kills in probably the entire franchise. And if I had to put this movie up against against the other movies of this franchise, it would probably sit at my third or fourth favorite. But as it is also a movie, I'll judge it as such and not just hold it up to the rest of the franchise because that is a very low bar to set, my friend. <laughs> On with the positives though, and going back to the kills, there were some that I truly have never seen the likes of before. And it's hard to pick out a favorite, but I think if I had to choose, the first and last kills of the movie are really what stick out in my mind. And I will say that if you just pull scenes out 
out of the movie, there are some really strong scenes. Just, just forget the narrative. Like there are really good moments of this movie. Some of them are genuinely pretty tense and they had a lot of good tricks up their sleeve. And it's all heavily enhanced by the cinematography. This is a beautiful movie. That's why it makes me so sad that the script was terrible because you could just see all this gorgeous wasted potential. They play with the color and the lighting really well. There are some moments of high contrast with great silhouette kind of moments and other awesome lighting contrast with the color. Like here you can see the orange against the blue or here with the red against the blue. It was a really beautiful looking movie at times. I'm also a big fan of the wide shots, which I think could have been inspired by the original, but it's also very much giving me scary stories to tell in the dark. Similar almost fairy tale like quality to the cinematography, just really intentional with the coloring, I think to make it as cinematic as possible. Or that's just the impression that I got. But my only remaining positive is that I think we actually did get a few decent acting performances. Even though the writing for him was extraordinarily questionable, we had a really great Leatherface. Like in general, I think his movements and performance probably couldn't have been much better. Another standout was, oddly enough, this side character Texan trope dude. And I mentioned him because he played the trope very well. That brings us to the end of my praises though, because everything else about this movie was pretty bad. Going right back to the Texan trope dude, he was completely wasted. They bring up all these really stereotypical traits of like the gun-toting, polluting, truck-driving dude, and he interacts with all of the city folk, and you think, okay, maybe this is meant to be kind of thematic in the melding of their worlds or something, but it amounts to diddly squat. Nothing. There's also a black character named Dante in this movie who has a tiny meaningless subplot where he has to get a confederate flag taken down. And I guess that everything about that is meant to be subtextual, but it's very unclear what they were trying to say with that. On the one hand, his motivation to get it taken down seems to purely be from the standpoint of, oh no, our clientele won't want to buy this house if they see that flag. And on the other hand, there's this old white lady that lives in said house with the flag and she's like, oh, well, that flag just reminds me of my heritage. It was my grandfather's. So it's like, what are you trying to say, movie? Don't be mad at stupid white people for keeping their confederate flags up. It just reminds them of their family. Because then a whole thing happens with her character and I guess you're supposed to sympathize with her. It's very unclear to me. I think that maybe it's supposed to make us hate Leatherface more. Like it's supposed to associate his family with a very racist symbol. Basically just to ensure that we don't ever sympathize with him, but it's like, girl, when did we ever? All the politics of this movie are extremely messy, probably the worst of which being this really random school shooting subplot. Number one, it was handled in very poor taste, and number two, it truly had nothing to do with the plot. You could have taken that out and it wouldn't have changed the movie at all. The only thing that it did was pad out the runtime. And I hate to say it, but the same exact thing could have been said for the subplot with bringing Sally Hardesty back. She's a final girl that I have a ton of respect for. She's one of my favorites and she was really the only reason why a lot of people were excited to watch this new installment because obviously recently bringing back legacy characters has been a slam dunk. But if you take her out of the movie, it makes absolutely no difference. I think that's the movie's biggest problem because you just had all of these different plot lines that had no intersection. Like there's no cohesion to the movie. There's another subplot where these characters spend an eon trying to figure out whose name is on the deed for this house in this abandoned town. Like, do we as an audience, or the, does the plot itself even rely on who actually owns that house? Maybe that would have had meaning if they desired to explain literally anything about the subplots of this movie. You're left kind of wanting more because number one, it's a very short movie at an hour and 20 minutes, so it has super rapid pacing. That should actually be considered a positive. But two, because pretty much nothing is ever explained with all these random ass subplots. They seemed to recognize everything that worked about Halloween 2018, but then they had no idea how to actually use any of those tools to their advantage. They brought back Sally and she had this really weird Lori-esque kind of character arc that truly didn't make any sense for Sally as a character. Because from what happened to her back in 1974, that woman would have been broken. She would have gotten the hell out of Texas. She has kind of like a revenge subplot in this movie and it just does not work. They seemed to try to inject commentary in this movie, kind of the way that they did in Halloween, where Halloween is about grief and generational trauma. But then as I mentioned earlier, all of the politics of this movie are so messy and oftentimes they don't contribute
attribute any meaning to the characters' motivations. And the characters were all just completely one-dimensional, so it's not like there was much to explore with them anyways. Oh, and the characters make horrible nonsense decisions, but more on that later. And maybe they thought they could get away with having really stupid characters because it's a common trope of slashers. But if Halloween and Scream have taught us nothing, it's that fans love it when you break free of those tropes. So overall, do I recommend this movie if you haven't seen it? Actually, yes and no. If you want entertainment value and a fun time, I think this is a fine movie for that. I personally did have some fun with it, but all of the other issues of the movie just were so unbearably distracting. If it had fully committed to being a dumpster fire like Next Generation, then maybe I would have had more fun with it. But they were just trying to do so much and clearly had no idea how to execute any of like the commentary they were trying to put in. But I do want to clarify that for the people that loved this movie, Movie, I feel like I do understand. I would say that in general, most people that watch movies just watch them for the entertainment value. Like they are not gonna get too distracted by all the other stuff that I mentioned. So I understand the people that are loving this movie. And of course I also understand the people that don't like this movie because I don't like this movie. But I think the whole Twitter war going on is a little bit unnecessary. But the silver lining with that is like, hey, all us horror fans are talking about the same thing and we're all coming together on this topic. So if you haven't seen it yet, it's only an hour and 20 minutes. I don't think it's going to be a waste of your time. If nothing else, then you can join us in all the discourse. So do with that what you will. It's now time to get into the plot breakdown. So spoiler warning, I'm going to be spoiling literally the entire movie now. So the movie starts by telling us that Sally Hardesty has shared her story, but she spent about 30 years of her life trying to track down Leatherface as a sheriff, but she could never find him. So let's stop right there. Immediately no. Uh, no. <laughs> I let it slide with Lori that she was still in Haddonfield because they dealt with her trauma really well. They showcased her fighting for her life in social situations, just clearly exhibiting extreme agoraphobia. They showed the immense deterioration of her family relationships. And in TCM, there was absolutely none of that going on because Sally was just a useless side character. She could have been anyone. It didn't need to be Sally. It was so weird. So anyways, then we follow four young adults to an abandoned town that they plan to auction off. Behold the joys of late stage capitalism. Oh! However, some of the residents are not too pleased, least of which being the mother of Leatherface who has an episode and she passes away in the sheriff's car before she can receive help. Hold on to that information for later because this is a subplot that makes absolutely no sense to me. Just hold on to the fact that the sheriff literally said, what are you still doing here? We tried to kick you out weeks ago. Also worth noting because this is a direct sequel to the original, one of two things have to be true and this first thing is kind of like what the movie is selling. So either Leatherface is like 75 to 80 years old at this point and this woman is either his 100 year old mother or just some random old lady that took him in. Maybe you could explain it by this really brief moment of exposition that was thrown in where it's like a picture of him at this orphanage like what the house used to be. So I guess it's implied that because all of his family died he was a teenager at the time of the events of TCM 1974. So then he was taken into the orphanage. Or, and this is because he clearly is not 80 years old in this movie, like his movements, even the way he looks before he puts his mask on, this seems like a completely different Leatherface that just has nothing to do with all the events of the original movie. Like he's just some new guy that also enjoys wearing skin and cutting people up. There are just several continuity issues that the movie chooses to ignore. But this is also where the movie really started to ramp up and it truly didn't slow down for the rest of the entire runtime and we're only 18 minutes in. So then Leatherface snaps at the death of his mother, killing everyone who accompanied him in the car, but not before he peels the skin off his mother's corpse to wear as his own. This was one of my favorite scenes of the movie. I really had never seen a death like that before where he literally broke someone's wrist and used their protruding bones to stab them in the neck. That was ingenuity. That was craftsmanship. That's me making someone gay. <laughs> 
It was also very tense when girl number one was trying to like crawl out of the car and suss out the situation. I call her girl number one because after this, there was no mention of her for the rest of the entire movie and she's meant to be Dante's girlfriend. So some of the meaning of that cool scene has kind of been stripped away after having seen the rest of the movie because she is never mentioned again for the rest of the movie. And I do get that the events of this movie take place over the course of one day, but literally not one person thought to go, hey, is girl number one okay? Anyway, at this point, all these influencers have arrived in their party bus to the town, but Lila has slunk off to go talk about guns with gun boy, but when she tries to hold one, she finds it too triggering, pun sort of intended. But yeah, her PTSD is triggered by holding the weapon because she had previously survived a school shooting and she had been shot before. But as I mentioned earlier, this has no meaning to the plot. It's kind of meant to service like her character development. It's all truly just filler. Like they wrote all these really great kills and then they were like, oh shit, we, we gotta think of a story to go between them. So we get really weird scenes like this where she's sitting with gun boy and she's like, so what's it like to just, you know, pollute the air and not give a shit? Um, I don't know. You want to hold this gun? And being in the audience, I just could not make sense of what we were doing there in that moment. But after that, Mel can't reckon with the fact that they may have caused this old lady to croak because she thinks they might not have had the deed to her house after all. Can you understand why I don't give even half of a fuck about this? Because remember how earlier I told you the sheriff said, hey, what are you doing here? We already tried to evict you. So if the sheriffs were there weeks ago, it would be because of a legal proceeding where they got the paperwork that her house was purchased and she no longer had the right to live there. So why is Mel so concerned? Is the proof not already there that the sheriffs are like witnesses to the situation and they clearly have already gotten the necessary paperwork to evict her? Somehow I neglected to mention the fact that she did find the deed and it was in the old lady's name. And I'm like, how? How? <laughs> That also brings up a whole thing about like the housing crisis in this country. I do not want to go there. But in terms of the movie, I know that I shouldn't care this much because they just needed a reason to get these people into the house and to get a conflict to like rile up Leatherface or something. But I can't make sense of the fact that they thought that we as audience members would care about why these people are still in the house. A better reason in my opinion would be like, okay, maybe have them bring in some of their new clientele to be like, oh, this house could be yours someday. Let's go look at the bedroom upstairs. But then of course they're surprised by Leatherface being there and he starts to carve them up. Look how easy it was for me to fix that. I'm mad. But also, and even though I love the scene with the car, he was taken way out of town and made it back in kind of an unrealistic amount of time. So there were so many ways to workshop that. Like, ah, uh, <laughs> moving on. So they're in the house and Dante gets cut up by Leatherface, which is actually a really cool epic moment of filmmaking with the whole swinging door thing. But Mel subsequently has to hide under the bed after witnessing Leatherface in action. And that scene of him doing his makeup and stuff might actually be a nod to the original, I'm not too sure. Because in the movie commentary of the original, Toby Hooper did say that they shot a scene of Leatherface kind of doing himself up and doing his makeup and putting his skin on and whatever. So maybe this was a little nod to that behind the scenes knowledge where they finally included a scene like that. Then surprise, Dante is alive, who comes walking out into daylight looking like an absolute mess. I really commend the design of this one actually, but then he dies. Also, this is the second time in the movie where somebody is surprise alive. The first time was the sheriff in the scene where girl number one tried to get out of the window. And this isn't even the last time it'll happen in this movie, so stay tuned. Truck man gun boy sees this and he's like, oh my god, what? So he comes to investigate the situation, but he's absolutely railed by Leatherface, like he for sure had one of the most brutal deaths. Then Lila is like, oh my god, where's my sister? But the woman on the bus is like, you don't want to go out there. And of course she does anyways. What's happening? She's trust me. Stay in your seat. This was so frustrating that I wanted to scream. All this woman had to do is say, hey, I saw a man with his face carved in half, so you probably want to stay on the bus. If I heard that, I could assure you my ass would not leave the bus. So anyway, she gets Mel and they're back on the bus, so of course they can't manage to keep Leatherface out for whatever reason. And he slaughters everyone on the bus, except for the main characters, of course, who escaped through the roof window. Try anything you can cancel, bro. Uh... 
This was another pretty scene, but I was working overtime to suspend my disbelief that these ridiculous siblings would be the only two people to figure out to like go into the bathroom during this whole situation. It was nothing compared to my frustration at the next scene. Oh my God. They run into Sally who locks them in her car and goes to confront Leatherface. And when she does, she's all like, say my name. Don't you remember what you did to my friends all those years ago? And of course he doesn't. And for some reason, she doesn't shoot him, which from a real world perspective, we were only at minute like 58 of the movie, so we weren't to the climax yet. Of course she couldn't shoot him. So rather than developing a coherent storyline where the character's decisions make sense, that was the choice they went with, I claim no understanding of this decision. And it also feels really out of character for Sally to not drive these girls away to safety because literally in the ending of the original movie, somebody drives her away. A stranger comes up on the road and she escapes via car. So the extreme lack of a cinematic parallel has as me, just. Mm. She's doing all this because she wants to avenge her friends, which I get, but I just cannot believe that she would be willing to put these two girls' lives at risk like that. Because what's a car lock gonna do? He has a chainsaw. Also in this moment in the car, Lila is like, I was meant to die at school. Death followed me here. Like, girl, am I watching Final Destination right now? No? Then why was that the dialogue of choice? So then Sally gets butchered and it's real gnarly, like she's fully lifted up while being torn in half, which I really wasn't expecting. So like bravo for a good surprise death, I guess. But it was mostly unexpected because her character had no meaning up until that point. Like I was waiting for something, anything with her character. Then there's this whole weird girl boss moment where Mel is talking to Lila and she's like, you actually never needed me. You're the strongest person I know. And that is what inspires Lila to pick up the gun and confront Leatherface. The second time, actually, because in the previous scene, she had already picked up a gun and that's where we got the lovely, hey, Leatherfuck line. So I don't know how she went from holding a gun to then in the next scene being like, oh my God, I don't know if I can hold this gun. It's not earned in the slightest. It's very off-putting to me because Lila is meant to have gone from being the victim of a school shooting to being the shooter herself and that's like meant to be her character arc. She looks really menacing and she's walking into a theater which if you live in the United States you know why that's kind of like in really poor taste. <laughs> wild wild choices man. It's very messy. That's why on Letterboxd in my review I said I guess we're a girl bossing school shootings now because like what the hell is this? That topic demands a much more elevated conversation and this was not it. Maybe it would have slightly worked like a little bit if the characters and their relationships weren't paper thin, but alas, we're just left sitting there like, okay, that was a choice. Then psych, Sally is still alive. Third time this has happened and she shoots Leatherface. The way this woman would have been so deceased and the way that this was a third time that they said psych, nope, this person's not dead, they're still alive. In the grand finale though, Leatherface tackles Lila into some mucky ass water. We see none of the ensuing fight before she pulls herself out. And in yet another Another surprise return, Mel comes to the rescue to whap Leatherface in a clean uppercut back into the water. You just drop in and just smack the lip, whoop, drop down, snap. We then take a brief detour for a car commercial before Mel is grabbed out of the window by Leatherface for one last decapitation and a subtle nod to the original with him swinging his chainsaw around. To give credit where it's due, I really liked that last kill. I thought it was very surprising, very fun. It's a decent ending, but the whole climax leading up to it, Nah, you cannot, during the climax of a movie, not show every part of the fight. Even if it's underwater, this is the crescendo of the whole movie we've been watching up to this point, and you're gonna rob me of that? Also, don't bring back the woman that got sawed in half. I don't know if it's implied that she could have survived that, but taking a chainsaw all the way up your- No! But that's the end! How do we feel? Do you think this will spawn a sequel, or do you think that enough fans will be angry about it, that they'll just kind of learn their lesson? and take the L because they already went through the whole hullabaloo of like not being able to sell their movie off and having a ton of failed screenings. But there is a minority of people that had a lot of fun with it and there are good parts of this movie. There is some potential. I personally do not care to see another Texas Chainsaw Massacre movie. I didn't before this and I still don't now. But where do you fall? Are you one of the fans that's like, how dare they make a direct sequel to this masterpiece and completely waste the potential? Or are you one of the fans 
Bones that has just completely given in to the mediocrity of this franchise and you're like, well, at least they were good kills. I'm a little bit of both because it was really entertaining, but I can't deny the wasted potential because it was just so obvious. I just wish that those kills had been maybe in the 2003 remake or something. Also at the end of the day, I'm like, is this movie just making a mockery of requels and franchise reboots in general? Am I just not in on the joke? I mean, Sally returns and she's a character that we have loved for almost 50 years at this point and she finally returns only to be ripped in half. <laughs> because on one hand, I feel like it's really disrespectful to a character that we would genuinely be really curious about. Like, what character development would Sally undergo after experiencing that? But on the other hand, I feel like maybe we're supposed to be in on the joke that like Leatherface doesn't care and that is in character for Leatherface. But I don't know. I can't make sense of it. All I know is that I feel no urge to revisit it anytime soon and it's a two out of five star movie for me. To conclude, of course, as always, I want to thank my patrons for their continued support. If you would also like bonus content and to get my smooches at the end of every single video, my Patreon is linked down below. But that's gonna do it, loves. Don't forget to like and subscribe if you enjoyed this content. It lets me know that I should make more of it. I hope you have a beautiful day and I hope I catch you in the next one. Bye!